Well, welcome everyone to the last Crown Center seminar for the 2023-24 academic year. Um, this is a very special seminar as far as we're concerned at the Crown Center um, because we invited Professor Wedeen to come in uh, March of 2020 or April of 2020 and uh, one global pandemic and some other events later, she has finally arrived. Um, and of course, um, she's gonna be in conversation for our wonderful colleague, um, Daniel Neep. Um, in some ways, uh, neither of these two, um, our speakers uh, need any introduction. If you follow Syria, they are some of what two of the foremost experts on Syria, but I will nonetheless give an um, introduction to both and um, then we'll start with um, the politics of disavowal, what Syria can tell us about American authoritarianism. So Lisa Wedeen is the Mary R. Morton Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science and the college, director of the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, which I just learned is gonna celebrate its 20th anniversary this year, and associate faculty in anthropology at the University of Chicago. She is the recipient of many awards and the author of many books. Um, her three books are Ambiguities of Domination, Politics, Rhetoric, and Symbols in Contemporary Syria, which is a, was a must read book when I was in grad school, um, um, but it has a new preface. There is Peripheral Visions, Publics, Power and Performance in Yemen and Authoritarian Apprehensions, Ideology, Judgment and Mourning in Syria. Um, that book has won so many awards. Um, I'm only going to mention the last two awards that it won, uh, which is the EPSA Award for Concept An Analysis in Political Science and the Gordon J. Lang Award for a book that brings the most distinction to the University of Chicago Press, which is the press for this book. Um, Professor Weedeen has just published a new co-edited volume in January with Joseph Masco entitled conspiracy forward slash theory. And I'm particularly excited because she's going to be working on a book on revolutionary disappointment. Now, Professor Wedding will um, give as usual with the Crown Seminars a seven to eight minute um, opening thoughts. And then she will be in conversation with, we are gonna claim um, Dr. Daniel Neep as our own with our very own Daniel Neep. Um, Daniel Neep is a political scientist who works on conflict and state building in the Middle East with a focus on Syria, where he has spent several years in from the late 1990s up until 2012. Um, he is the author of Occupying Syria, Insurgency, Space, and State Formation, and is currently, and excitedly for me, finishing his second book, The Nation Belongs to All, The Making of Modern Syria, which talks about various aspects of Syria's development. Um, his research has also been supported and he's been awarded so many different grants from the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars, the American Jews Foundation, the British Academy, the Council for British Research in the Levant, and the list goes on. Um, Daniel Neep was a, used to be a faculty, was a faculty lead fellow at the Crown Center. And because we could not let him go, he is now currently a non-resident fellow at the Crown Center. I'm very, very excited to um, have them both here. And I very much look forward to the fascinating conversation that we'll be having today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate being invited here and thank you all who are joining us online. Uh, Karen, can we have the first slide? So my book, Authoritarian Apprehensions, Ideology, Judgment, and Mourning in Syria, based on years of ethnographic fieldwork in the context of the Syrian uprising and the devolution into war, asked, how has the regime been able to bear the brunt of the challenges raised against it? And what does the Syrian example tell us about the seductions of authoritarian politics more generally? And so my approach to this orienting puzzle identified novel modes of ideological interpolation, borrowing Louis Althusser's term. In other words, new ways of hailing citizens into Syria's autocratic system. From various angles, the book investigated the complicated, varied 
often incoherent forms of address that secured enough citizen buy-in for the regime to survive. Next slide, please. Ideology works through seduction, arousing fantasy content while simultaneously diffusing it and smoothing out contradictions. It helps manage collective anxieties and socio-political incompatibilities by providing mechanisms that allow dissonances to be contained, displaced, and disavowed. So as containment, next slide please, ideology operates by making what are essentially social and historical anxieties seem natural and inevitable, arousing desires and then placing them in check. Next slide. This containment also works through modes of hyper-identification when we can fantasize about images of celebrity glamour or elegance or composure or whatever, without necessarily believing that we will ever be able to emulate adequately the exemplar. Next slide, please. Ideology also works as displacement in which unbearable fears are relocated onto a new object, allaying anxieties by transferring unacceptable attributes onto a fantasy other. So conspiracies of national undoing that put terrorists at the heart of the problem or projections of in-group violence outward, these are some processes of displacement which were frequently at work helping organize collective life in serious authoritarian circumstances as well as its war-torn ones. And perhaps the most provocative dimension, at least for me, of the book's argument about ideology was the account of disavowal. Next slide, please. So the famous theorist Octave Manoni noticed how people would rationalize their lives, acknowledging and disavowing simultaneously. The phrase, I know very well and yet nevertheless, exemplifies this mode of disavowal, a distancing from accountability that has implications for politics. In the case of Syria, the disavowal typically worked like this. I know very well that the regime is incorrigibly corrupt, and yet nevertheless, we can build government-sponsored civil society organizations that truly empower citizens. Or I know very well that Sunni gangs did not visit our village in the night, and yet nevertheless, they could have. Or among secular activists in the first two years of the uprising, I know very well that there are violent Islamic militants among the opposition, but nevertheless, they're not really a problem. Disavowal goes beyond denial in that the problem calling for judgment is at least posed. In disavowal, the power of ideology comes into especially bold relief, with subjects hailed into a position where the realities that can no longer be denied can still be dismissed. And in this sense, disavowal expresses the contradiction it simultaneously repudiates. So in sum, the book tried to show how ideology matters in cultivating citizen attachments. It worked not only through outright belief, but through mechanisms that complicate belief and unbelief. It can generate loyalty, but also ambivalence. And in the case of Syria, this ambivalence, that toggle between desires for reform and the attachment to order, helps the regime recalibrate its relationship to rule. Next slide, please. The book also located pathways back to democratic potentiality and political judgment in comedy's capacity for irreverence, for example. Next slide, please. In artistic efforts to bypass the impasse of fake news by unsettling the conventions of documentary filmmaking and in the cultivation of interpretive generosity through imaginative exercises in representative thinking. And these are all important attempts to perform an incandescent other wiseness to the bleakness of what was then the present moment and it arguably still is. In exploring the limits of rebellion and the seductions of status quo conventionality, the book shows how the Syrian regime managed to produce an ambivalent middle, or what was referred to in Syria somewhat derisively as the gray people, invested in stability and fearful of alternatives. In doing so, I argue that what might best be described following Lauren Berlant as the ideology of the good life operated among key metropolitan populations to organize desire and quell dissent.
Syria's good life entailed not only the usual aspirations to economic well-being, but also fantasies of multicultural accommodation and a secure, sovereign, pride-inducing national identity. It's these visions and inducements to compliance in the first decade of President Bashar al-Assad's rule from 2000 to 2010 that were unevenly saturating and in flux that define the terms in which neoliberal autocracy was created, sustained, and in the context of the revolution, ultimately reconfigured. So even though the images of a kinder, gentler, enlightened chic regime were shown to be a thin veneer, hiding a brutality that would brook no dissent. In recent years, as the regime declares a tentative but by no means assured victory in the war, such images of glamour and glitz have returned. Next slide, please. The regime's first family aesthetic of loss and righteousness has been used by professional managerial cultural producers who take the ruins of war as cultural backdrop for new television melodramas, churning out scenes that operate in familiar ideological modes of containment, displacement, and disavowal. The rubble serves as a testimony to threats combated, order restored, neoliberal autocracy rejuvenated. Next slide, please. Found not only in stylized melodramas, but actually also, in actual photo ops of the first family, the ideological strategy is not to deny the heartbreak and loss so much as to appropriate it. Many Syrians today will find these narratives gross and false, but others will accept the familiar fantasy bribe to use Frederick Jameson's term, according to which they know very well that the brutal regime is responsible for much of the destruction, but nevertheless, it could be even worse, or yes, there's violence, but who's really responsible? The regime and opposition are both terrible. I'm not subscribing to this. I'm suggesting this is the ideology of disavowal, or this is disavowal at work. In the location of scenes of disavowal amid the ruins of war, the effect of these works is to admit and dismiss the violence simultaneously, on offer as a symbolic resolution to the soul-crushing devastation. But the order promised is still tyranny, albeit dressed in J. Crew-like clothing. And lest we think that this understanding of ideology is form with its mechanisms of containment, displacement, and disavowal is specific to Syria, these mechanisms operate everywhere. Although the content is context specific, the form is general. Final slide, please. In the United States, for example, in a Trumpian political universe, ideology works as containment by arousing white supremacist feelings of solidarity while smoothing out or managing white working class discontent. Ideology works as displacement in a Trumpian world by directly attacking Muslims or blacks or indigenous people, or in one specific instance of Trump fear mongering, calling Mexican immigrants rapists, and on countless occasions referring to COVID-19 as the China virus, and of course there are more contemporary examples as well. And ideology operates as disavowal. In the case of Trump supporters in the United States, disavowal typically works like this. I know very well that he shouldn't be saying racist things, but it is funny. Or I know very well that he lies, but politicians never tell the truth. Or I know very well that he said those lewd things about women, but it's just locker room talk. And boys will be boys. Unless we think that this mental sleight of hand is unique to Trump's constituencies, in capitalist societies, we tend to practice disavowal all the time. I know very well that ordering packages from Amazon exploits already precarious workers, but in a pandemic, I need my mask as quickly as possible. Or maybe now it's a book that has to be delivered in time for class. Or I know very well that the Trump presidency is the result of a deep flaw in our institutions of democratic government, and yet everything will be different if we can just get Biden into office. Or I know very well that there is industrial slaughter happening around the world at the moment in places like Gaza, and yet nevertheless, there, there really is no alternative to Biden. You get the point. Let me stop here and listen to your response, Daniel, and we can have a conversation and hopefully open it up to a larger audience as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, for thank you very much to the Crown Centre for facilitating this conversation and giving me a reason to revisit Lisa's uh, Lisa's work. Um, of course, um, many of you listening will have already read Authoritarian Apprehensions. Um, for those of you who have not, let me give you three reasons why you should, first of all, just give us a bit of broader context. Firstly, I think that in terms of what it contributes to our understanding of the Middle East, this book breaks obviously new ground. Um, Studies of authoritarian in the region of usually focus on what we often think of as material structures, you know, the will and capacity of coercive of the coercive apparatus, the balance of class forces, institutional incentives, the dull compulsion of economic logic. These are what are often held to be the motor engine of authoritarianism. All these forces are abstract. They don't delve into the lived experience of ordinary people. Uh, if you think about one of the big ideas in political science, the idea of the authoritarian bargain. Uh, you know, it's often talked about in the context of Egypt under Nasser, the idea that ordinary Egyptians trade their political freedoms in response for being provided social welfare. No one ever asks, you know, what this actually means for ordinary people. How do they go about this business of trading their political freedoms for social welfare? What Lisa's work does is help show how, how co-optation works. And it works not by the imposition or the acceptance of ideology, but by fostering this movement. I know very well that this setup is authoritarian and delimits my freedoms, yet nevertheless, I'm going to accept it. So it's, it's great at showing us the actual lived experience of authoritarianism. Um, secondly, particularly since the revolution in Syria, we have a lot of academic studies that focus on parts of the country that were previously marginalized in the academic discourse. Um, we know increasing amounts, you know, so much focus on the areas where the revolution starts where protests began, the Leif Damashk, the suburbs of Aleppo, um, the Mokhalafat in different parts of the country. We don't know as much about what things, what, what would life was like for the middle classes of um, the Syrian middle classes during this time. And that's also true from a, from a historical perspective too. If you think about the leftist thrust of Syrian historical and political writing, you know, from Abdullah Hanna through to Hanna Batatu, in some, way, in some ways, we know more about the life, the everyday lives of peasants in the 20s and 30s than we do the urban middle classes in the, 20, in, in the early 2000s in Syria. So I think, again, this, this kind of, by, by focusing not on the super rich elite, but on the middle classes, you know, the middle class professionals, the producers of culture, we do learn more about a group that has been understudied in Syria. And thirdly, for those of you who are not political scientists, and I think this is where Lisa's work really speaks to a much broader audience, authority and apprehensions takes seriously Syrians themselves as producers of knowledge and producers of theoretical understandings of their own society, not in abstract intellectual volumes, but in, in terms of cultural production. Um, it's a wonderful exploration, taking Syrian filmmakers seriously, taking Syrian artists seriously, taking Sir Syrian humorists seriously, and delving into what the materials they produce, what insights they can offer us into understanding how uh, authoritarianism works in the country. So I think this is a, a wonderful way of not relegating Syrian theorists to the footnotes of a work, but by giving them center stage. Um, in terms of furthering our conversation, Lisa, let me start off with three broad um, areas of discussion that I'd love to draw out your, your thoughts on a little bit for. Um, firstly, you mentioned the attractions of neoliberal autocracy in Syria during the first decade of Bashar al-Assad's rule. Um, for those in the audience who have only become familiar with Syria since since the outbreak of the revolution and during the civil war, it might seem odd to imagine a world where Bashar al-Assad as a forward thinking reformer was actually taken seriously. And yet for the first decade of his rule, many Syrians did take this idea seriously. Um, and part of that promise that he offered was, was in part the promise of material improvement, right? Um, how Syria began to be transformed, particularly from the 90s to the 2000s, from this very dour, austere, Soviet-style world of limited consumer choices, and you couldn't get particular brands, you know, it's impossible to get Coca-Cola in Syria in the 1990s. We were drinking mandarin, uh, locally produced, <laughs> uh, you know, this, this very limited world of consumer choices to the Syria of the 2000s, where restaurants appeared and cafes appeared and 
new clothes appeared and new cars appeared. This very increasingly ostentatious display of wealth was possible in a way it hadn't been for the previous 30, 40 years. Um, so there isn't a material element to that, but your argument is more about the effective uh, attachments that people bestowed, up, bestowed upon this reform project. So I'd love to ask you to speak about that first of all, um, about this, this, this idea of Bashar as a reformer, when it was still possible to take this idea seriously. What was it that attached people to this idea? Um, and secondly, just to continue that thought, how did this effective attachment to the reform project encounter the emergence of the security solution that the regime increasingly adopted in response to the protests in 2011, 2012 um, and afterwards. You know, I was in Damascus at the time and listening to the first, the three big speeches that Bashar al-Assad gave in 2011 and speaking to many people who might be uh, considered part of the group you focus on in your book. And there was a sense in which with each speech he gave, a little part of this effective attachment just faded a little bit. There was a sense in which each speech he gave, you know, the second speech should have been the first speech and the third speech should have been the second speech. With each speech, he grew harder in response to the protest. And with each speech, the idea of, uh, of the reformist project seemed to fade a little bit, seemed to dissipate. So how did that change? How does this um, effective attachment to reform survive that initial encounter with the violence and coercion and repression in the early years, in the early months of the, of the revolution. And finally, and this is a empirical and I guess methodological question, how do you go about studying ideology in a practical way? What are the material sites that you find useful for exploring these questions? Um, of course, we, we mentioned filmmaking, we mentioned humor and things like this. But of course, these are not simply, you know, um, ideology doesn't work in just idealistic ways. It's not a, um, you know, there's also a material infrastructure to producing films, to producing television shows. There's a whole politics that, that inform the production of this type of, of cultural work. So how do you, how do you explore these uh, questions empirically? And how do these, mechanisms of containment, displacement, disavowal show themselves in Syrians' own cultural production. Uh, that they're, you know, we're not just focusing on what the regime is uh, distributing and sending out to the citizens, but also on how Syrians themselves who are not part of the regime, how they um, circulate these uh, forms of ideology in their own work. So just to start off, I'd love to, to get your thoughts, thoughts on those three issues. Thanks very much. Those are great, great questions. I'm not sure I'll be able to do justice to any one of them. Uh, I do want to say thank you also for the um, in, insightful sort of distillation of, of the book. And I want to just underscore one of those points anew, which is namely that I do try to treat um, Syrian uh, artists in particular as political theorists in their own right. So that the kinds of uh, films or other sort of uh, uh, products that they generate are not simply evidence to be used to underscore a point, but they are openings, uh, part of uh, a, an effort to think with and through them and to put them into conversation with more, say, conventional political theorists like Hannah Arendt or Ludwig Wittgenstein. So that, that's in a very important move for me in, in the book. And I appreciate you bringing that to, to our collective attention. Um, you're absolutely right that I am uh, focused uh, in large part on affective attachments, and but I don't want to think of them as, as separate from the material or in that way that I guess uh, political science in particular used to think of there's the ideational world and there's the materialist world. And I really want to think of them as co-implicated at all times or dialectically related to put it in, in somewhat different terms. And so ideas are inscribed in material practices. Material practices have uh, a ideological uh, in the sense of I I ideational effects and that affect is shot through 
all of these activities, that there is no way of thinking about the regime and simply thinking about cognition. One has to think about the, the role that attachment plays, the way in which ambivalence works, the way in which a toggle, say, between the desire for reform and the attachment to uh, status quo conventionality, to order, uh, work together in some ways to enable the regime to recalibrate its relationship to rule. Now, it's, it, it is odd to think, uh, how could this guy in the first decade even be uh, a convincing reformer? And part of that had to do with the kind of uh, image production that generated visions of him as urbane, as uh, educated, as worldly, as, uh, you know, uh, well-versed or versed well enough in technology, as somebody committed to reform, even if it's constantly deferred. And one of the um, remarkable instances of disavowal that was reiterated over that decade was, I know very well that these reforms aren't happening, but nevertheless, they will or at one point, when we're ready, they will. A, a kind of also a, a, a buy-in to a modernization narrative um, that in retrospect was uh, deeply disturbing, but at the time had a certain resonance with a large parts of, of a metropolitan population. Um, now, the... I spent a lot of time in those first eight or so minutes talking about ideology as form, but you're right to point out ideology also had content to it. And that content, uh, what I and others talk about as neoliberal autocracy, was in the context of Syria three-pronged. So it didn't only deal with the possibilities of uh, economic prosperity and upward mobility. Uh, it also dealt with uh, a kind of sovereign national identity, uh, you know, where uh, there would be a certain amount of stability, but Syria, as opposed to other uh, countries, maintains some version of a kind of rejectionist front, or its relationship to Palestine was more palatable to people than, say, Egypt's at the time. So there we go. And, um, and also a kind of sense of multicultural accommodation, which became important in its own right in the context of the revolution and the devolution into war, where parts of that uh, of minority populations did uh, feel that the regime was the one that could guarantee their safety. And that became extraordinarily important in the context of the uprising itself. And the regime used that as a way of also, um, if not solidifying its control, again, you know, sort of re repurposing itself for the, the, the second decade of, of its rule. So protecting, being the guarantor of a certain kind kind of uh, minority existence became extraordinarily important. So that, that sense of multicultural accommodation as part of ideological content uh, began to play a kind of um, oversized role as possibilities for economic prosperity uh, seemed uh, dimmer and also the idea that these uh, borders could be sustained and non-porous also became much less promising. Nonetheless, that that, that sense of multicultural com uh, accommodation became, I would say, even, even more important. Um, and I guess uh, I, I do uh, want to just end by suggesting that um, that sense of affective attachment also uh, mattered in terms of the kinds of fear and foreboding that were happening in parts of the countryside allied with the regime, where sort of uh, false flag operations, for example, or aspects of anticipatory violence uh, enabled uh, forms of group solidarity, in-group solidarity, that uh, had they not existed, say, in the Alawi coastal areas, might have enabled uh, class attachments, say, the poor, um, aligning with one another in a way that was disallowed by this sense of affective insecurity, if you will. That's super interesting. And I think just to 
continue with your point you were making, thinking, uh, you know, thinking Bashar, the great reformer. Part of the attraction of that idea is not that Bashar, during the, his first decade, was um, able to accelerate the pace of reform, but that in some ways his difficulty at imposing the reform agenda actually made him more understandable to, to certainly to a younger generation of Syrians who saw Bashar as a representative of their generation, who was being hemmed in from above by the older generation. So the fact that Bashar was surrounded by the old guard had a certain parallel in the lives of many people who felt in their own careers and their own lives, they were hemmed in by an older generation. So I think that perhaps is a, a really important element of the question of, um, um, you know, this uh, policy of the reformist. Absolutely. Um, and the fact as, is not, you're yeah. Saying, yeah, as you're saying too, and this is not a point, I mean, it's a point in the book, but I, I, I didn't mention it here. Many activists at the beginning of the revolution anticipated that he would now concede and either uh, deliver the reforms or step down. And there were uh, multiple narratives of, you know, well, this is really about uh, the brother taking control, where he sort of stood out initially as somebody who was being, as you say, hemmed in by an old guard. And even when uh, people uh, became extraordinarily disillusioned with him, there was a sort of an interim moment where she uh, still had a certain kind of uh, credibility or generated a certain amount of affection. Oh, she's being drugged. She's be and and now, of course, this kinder, gentler version of autocracy has been completely shown to be a, 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 a veneer. But there were those months at the beginning of the uprising where even a number of activists were quite surprised by the brutality of the regime's response because they had, in part, bought into this version of the benevolent dictatorship. Yeah, and we certainly saw in the initial months, uh, initial weeks and of the revolution, um, a kind of uncertain response from the regime. There's a carrot and stick approach dealing with the protesters. And it did seem like there was some kind of struggle going on within the regime and yeah. different approaches, arguments for different approaches, um, a security response or more concessions were being you know, argued within the regime itself before the regime reconfigured. And it, it does make me think about this question of, it's interesting to think about this idea of reformers in the Middle East and in in the, in using this lens of disavowal that you talked about, uh, because we, we, we like a good reformer in the region. Uh, you know, this very similar we uh, like a good reformer. About, <laughs> we like a good reformer. We like King Abdullah of Jordan. We like Mohammed bin Salman. We like these individuals who promise reform. And yet we know we being, you know, sitting outside the region on the West, right? And yet we often know that these, the promise of reform um, is, is, um, is an illusion, right? We know that it's an idea that we're falling for. It's a myth of, of progress. So disavowal, this, this idea of disavowal is, is, is not just something that's um, particular to Syria. It's not just something that's particular to Bashar, but it applies when we think about, you know, uh, Mohammed bin Salman as a reformer in Saudi Arabia. It applies when we think about Saddam Hussein, even in the 1980s. I know that this guy is an authoritarian, and yet he's helping U.S. interests by engaging in a war with Iran. So there's a, a kind of dual thing going on that makes it um, not just, you know, uh, makes it much more generalizable. And I guess that's a good point to bring in your um, provocative uh, discussion of Donald Trump at the end. Um, and I can certainly see how a very similar process of disavowal might work for individuals who end up voting for a character like Donald Trump, who, you know, do not necessarily want to endorse his political program wholeheartedly, but find themselves voting for it despite or in spite of the fact um, that some elements of his program are are excessive to say the least. I, I I wonder whether it might be stretching the concept a little bit too far to extend that to, as you did, the use of using Amazon for delivering uh, books during the masks during the pandemic or a book in time for class, which many of us may be guilty of. Um, yes, I can see how this idea of disavowal would apply to the context of contemporary um, accelerated capitalism. You know, I order my books from Amazon, even though I know it exploits people. And yet 
I, I, it, are we saying then this idea of disavowal doesn't just apply to neoliberal autocracy? It doesn't just apply to 2024. It doesn't just apply, it, but it applies much more generally to capitalism and authoritarianism. And perhaps it's just a regular part of everyday life. It's just something that individuals do. We have to disavow things in order to make peace with the world that it is. And if that's true, if disavowal is ubiquitous, then there is no possibility of escaping it, right? It's a utopian project to try and escape it, which you know raises all kinds of problems and, and challenges in terms of, you know, why do we bother resisting it? Why do we bother? trying to come up with the idea if you know if it's so impossible to escape uh disavowal then then how do we respond to that world i guess i'm asking um and you, you do give some some wonderful examples in um authoritarian apprehensions about how syrians themselves you know, kind of respond to this this challenge of how do we actually escape this situation and and, and, and create a rupture with the the the, the, the forms of co-optation that they're sucked into so yeah. that, that was a lot of a lot of yeah no no there, it, yeah, it, it's, it's, my great, line of thinking. it's a great question it's it's a great question and I realize I didn't answer your question about the practice of ethnography I'll answer this one first and then go back to that if that's okay um, so you know Al Jazeera says at one point that ideology has no history. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean ideology as content has no history. It means ideology as form is transhistorical and cross-cultural and cross-regional, et cetera. So as you point out, disavowal is a general kind of condition. And there is no world without ideology. I don't subscribe to the version of ideology as false consciousness. That presumes there's a true consciousness, and I don't adhere to that particular understanding of ideology, which is one of the reasons that I'm much more influenced by the kind of cultural Marxist that came subsequent to Althusser. But it's important to note that this notion of disavowal is not something that we can escape. But we can have a certain kind of creative estrangement in relationship to it. We can practice uh, modes of attunement to kind of um, give us a little bit more wiggle room, if you will, and um, be more aware of the ways in which um, our practices of disavowal may be, say, doing harm to, to others, um, and to make choices with that kind of discernment in bold relief, I think might help to change our practices. Discussing this with others, generating collective conditions for um, being a, a bit more self-conscious of the ways in which um, some aspects of our disavowal can be changed, although disavowal itself can never be mm. eliminated. And so mm. I don't have to actually on the basis or with the alibi of convenience order my books from Amazon. I don't have to do that. And um, there are ways of thinking less, you know, morally, oh, bad sinner, you're doing this, and more um, politically about what are the kinds of choices that we make that we really do not have to make, that through sort of issues of convenience or laziness or however we want to think about it, we, we engage in, that we could do otherwise. And for me, one of the things I've learned from Syrians, among many things, is to um, think very seriously about the kinds of horizons of the taken for granted to use Stuart Hall's term and to try to um, unsettle them in a variety of ways, mm. to scale the impasses, to bypass the impasses, to think with that kind of version of creative estrangement that I see so many Syrian artists engaging in, wrestling with in their efforts in this moment also, uh, struggle over who gets to have the narrative about what happened in Syria. So, and that's uh, that's part of the challenge. Oh, sorry, 
No, no, I was, I was just, just going to say add, about I, the 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 um, ethnography part. You know, it starts yes. out in Syria, but of course, as things devolve into war, I also uh, move out of Syria and um, to a much more multi-sided kind of ethnography. Um, I, I try to talk to as many people as I can and to engage in as many life experiences with others as I can to learn for them from from everyone and to treat each interpretive encounter as one um, that, uh, you know, is humbling uh, for, for me. Um, practically, that means sometimes teaching uh, uh, students like I did in the border, Syria-Turkish border, thanks to um, the Karim Foundation that works on the Syria and Turkish border. Um, it means subtitling movies for colleagues. It means it meant uh, initially before and at the beginning of the uprising, also doing work for advertising agencies uh, within Syria, teaching English to, to folks. Um, so not just um, the conventional kind of political science interview, but uh, living in, in multiple worlds that uh, allow uh, me to uh, think differently uh, about mine. Yeah, that's that's really important, I think. But but I think your book also highlights some of the some of the many challenges about building a wedge, so opening up hope for the future, particularly in a world where we are we don't always agree on the facts, we don't always agree on what is happening in the world we live on. Um, some of the most basic facts about events in the world are disputed, um, and such radically different narratives propagated about them. You talk in your book about, of course, the, the famous, now famous example of Oshush, who was the author of the uh, one of the revolutionary Dabki songs. And there's a whole, but there's a whole mystery, or was he? And there's this whole um, uh, rumor mill, uh, this whole circulation of different accounts of what happened about that individual that, you know, cast into doubt the possibility of making firm decisions about about events and uh, cr creating concrete knowledge about the world um you know we think about the types of misinformation that was spread about chemical weapons uh, attacks in syria as well and the way in which these different narratives are propagated with such conviction it overwhelms people with information overwhelms people with different possible narratives they can use or invoke in particular circumstances to make sense of what's happening so that goes to the question of how do we see patterns in this chaotic world of information overload we're now living in. And I was interested to hear about your new, more recent work on conspiracies, um, which sounds like it might be some kind of way to make sense of this information overload. I, I would love to hear a little bit of, more about that. How do how does conspiracy feed into these, these processes? Um, and, you know, how does conspiracy further or possibly even undermine um, the workings of ideology that you talk about in the Syrian case. Yeah, thank you. Uh, while there, as usual, Daniel, there is a lot of going on in those questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so let me say a little bit um, in in authoritarian uh, apprehensions. You you're referring really to chapter three and the kind of uh, atmospheres of doubt, if you will, that emerge in the context of the the revolution and the sort of oversaturation of information and what I call at certain points in the chapter a kind of high speed eventfulness as well. And you know, it used to be that understandings of authoritarianism were all about out how there wasn't enough information. But one of the things I found from my field work was that wasn't the problem. The problem was, as you just suggested, a kind of uh, information overload. And that certainly is exacerbated by um, various uh, social media technologies that hadn't existed uh, prior. Um, and this question of misinformation really um, in the context of epistemic murk or epistemic precarity or epistemic mm. uncertainty um, really had two different kinds of effects. One was the more familiar to us, uh, uh, you know, in uh, scholarly conversations, which is generating a certain set of siloed publics or echo chambers where we all sort of just gravitate to those sites that confirm what we already know or, um, 
you know, highlight things that um, enhance our confirmation bias or however one wants to think about that. And even there, there are some tricky issues about, well, are we gravitating towards those sites or is this part of a kind of filter bubble problem, to use Eli Peretzer's term, um, where the algorithm is helping us for sure gravitate to these kinds of sites. And the implications of thinking it's the algorithm or thinking it's us or a combination matter for the kinds of fixes or suggestions of, uh, of ways to, to address or resolve this problem. Probably not resolvable, but address the problem. The other uh, aspect of, of the argument that in some ways is, uh, for me, um, at least uh, more, more interesting, I don't know about for other people, but was the idea that this kind of confusion, this level of epistemic murk, which is not specific to Syria, but is more global, let's face it, also generates the conditions of a certain kind of political paralysis, an alibi for not judging mm. at all. And that really did matter in the first couple of years of the, the Syrian uh, uh, revolution uh, among this kind of gray-oriented professional managerial elite in particular, I would say. Now, um, you know, it is very hard to know what to do about these questions of misinformation, disinformation, um, certainly working on um, undoing algorithms uh, that promote those um, dealing with bots, et cetera. I mean, these are all important kind of technical uh, managerial kinds of, of fixes. One of the things that I found so remarkable in Syria is the ways in which also Syrian artists uh, uh, recognize that they needed to bypass the impasse of, oh no, we just need more facts, better facts, and ultimately we'll come to a shared understanding of the truth, but instead to kind of undermine the whole um, uh, sort of convention, say, of documentary filmmaking by opening up conversations that allowed you to re-engage the facts or a, a multiple set of facts without necessarily having to um, uh, believe that if only we had enough evidence um, people would come to share my mm. view, operating with other kinds of creative strategies to get people to rethink their underlying assumptions or to open up conversations that were otherwise foreclosed. Having said that, I do think also the kinds of um, organizations like Taqqud and others that uh, existed uh, among Syria, Syrians inside and in, in exile that were um, devoted to trying to get people to see the facts, to try to show up, were also extraordinarily important. And as Hannah Arendt has also taught us, facts are stubborn. So the idea that, you know, you don't know what's going on at a certain point, that there's just too much confusion, that the atmosphere of doubt is too overwhelming, doesn't mean that over time we won't come to know. And I think that's actually very important. Whether we'll still care in this in these new conditions of high speed eventfulness is a different story. And I honestly don't know. Yeah, I th and I think that's important, that I, you know, your point that Facts are stubborn um, is something that continues to motivate many Syrians, particularly those involved in documenting human rights abuses and atrocities in Syria. who are doing wonderful work about collecting data and evidence and interviews exactly. and so forth in the hope that the world will remember and there will be some kind of accounting for what has happened over the last, over the last 13 years now. Um, as you say, whether or not that will actually come about, whether the world will continue to care, given, given uh, the ongoing atrocities unfolding in the region, um, is another question, fortunately. Let us, let us, at this point, bring in some of the questions from our audience. Um, what I will do is um, I will take a quick look at some of these questions, and perhaps if questions overlap, we will join two questions together just to keep the conversation going. And the first question I want to um, ask you, Lisa, is um, comes from Ian van der Mulen, which is asking you to connect the arguments. This is super interesting: the argument in authoritarian apprehensions to your earlier work in ambiguities of domination. Um, and ambiguities of domination, for those of you who don't know, it is this wonderful exploration of the uh, the 
the, the, not quite the personality cult, but not solely the personality cult, but the workings of ideology. And in, in Syria, under Hafez al-Assad, before Bashar. And it's very famous for its notion of acting as if. The fact that Syrians are obliged to comport themselves in accordance with the formal uh, requirements of parroting certain slogans about the regime without actually having to believe it. So this idea of acting as if. So how does, Lisa, how does your theorization of the politics of disavowal connect or build on or differ from the earlier theorization of the politics of as if? Um, are these, is there an ideological shift amongst the Syrian public? Are they, has, has disavowal replaced as if? Are the two operating side by side in hand? In hand or how, how, so how do these two ideas relate firstly? Yeah, well, I think there are, you know, there were two different Syrias, the Syria of Hafez al-Assad and the Syria of Bashar, a much more reform-minded, um, which was a, a, an attempt in some ways to win hearts and minds in a way that by the end, at least of the Hafez al-Assad area, that the, the politics of public dissimulation were so overwhelming. So there's already a difference. There are two different eras in Syria from 1970 to 2000 and then 2000 to 2010, okay? Um, but there are also um, uh, uh, different orientations towards ideology um, that have to do with my own uh, reading over time. Um, uh, ambiguities of domination was um, a, a very narrow question um, in the sense that it asked, why bother with a cult of personality whose rituals of obeisance are transparently phony? Nobody believes uh, that Hafez al-Assad will live forever, that he wins elections by 99.2% of the vote. And so the, the book was really about uh, making the argument that these practices of a preposterous quote or flagrantly fictitious claims or uh, rituals of obeisance that are transparently phony they, they matter, but they don't matter in the way that, say, scholars of legitimacy or hegemony say. They don't presuppose belief or emotional commitment, nor are they relegated to the sidelines in the ways that, say, folks who sort of subscribe to a simply materialist understanding of the world would suggest. That is to say, politics are about material interests and the groups articulating them, but the state chose to spend tremendous amounts of resources on this kind of symbolic display. But that book really did ask a very narrow question. And then my answer to the question was, well, the cult does matter. But it matters in terms of enforcing obedience, inducing complicity, structuring the terms within which a certain kind of resistance can take place. In doing that work, I wasn't really aware of cultural Marxist theory in the way that I became aware of it. And my understanding of ideology was really ideology as content. Moreover, um, um, there was, and I and some critics pointed this out, and I don't think they're wrong about that. I think it was a little bit, you know, wasn't nice, but um, you know, where there was kind of there was belief and unbelief. There was a kind of dichotomy there. And one of the efforts in the new book um, was to try to think about the ways in which people can believe something and not believe it at the very same time. And so it mm -hmm. I, I want to uh, complicate the dichotomy and to really, instead of thinking about ambiguity, thinking about ambivalence, the ways in which we as human beings are torn and the relevance that might have for political action. Hmm. Interesting. And I think certainly this idea of, you know, as you say, there was a shift between the eras of Hafez and Bashar and politics yes. worked differently in the early 2000s. And I think that perhaps helps us understand how it's possible to think about Bashar's first, first decade as neoliberal autocracy. Uh, although we often think of neoliberalism in terms of the management of the economy, financialization, the restoration of class power, it's also about governing through freedom. And yes. that possibility of governing through freedom was much more prevalent, much more possible. It wasn't possible to all Syrians, of course. The living in the northeast of Syria in the 2000s, this did not apply. But for the profess professional classes you're talking about in Damascus and Aleppo, that possibility of governing through freedom was more apparent. So that, that makes sense. And it was interesting, I thought, um, you know, living through the first months of the revolution, how quickly people started going back to, or Syrians of a certain age started going back to the old slogans, the old way of doing things, the politics of acting as if, because after the revolution broke out, keep your head down, 
you very suddenly started parroting the same types of narrative that the regime was banding about. And there was a, a going back to that older way of, um, you know, not not replicating simply the personality cult, but the, the claims of the regime writ large. So I think that's that's a really interesting point. Let's uh, a couple of other questions, and this is um, it's an interesting, a uh, great question from Gabriel Young. Um, the ideological processes of disavowal and displacement seem to be mostly the work of these professional managerial classes in fairly affluent urban centers, Damascus, Aleppo. And the question is, how relevant or even possible was disavowal in the more marginal provincial towns and rural spaces where the revolution began? Um, did the same mechanisms, were they even possible um, outside these particular class fractions that you're looking at? Yeah, well, uh, uh, that's a great question, and and one thing is, although you know, the the, the grey people that maybe there were a preponderance of them in these professional managerial metropolitan centers, um, disavowal would work in other areas just differently. So among activists mm. and not necessarily activists in major metropolitan areas in the beginning of the uprising, but in parts of the reef uh, and rural areas and not not only the Reef of Dimashq, but other parts of the country, there uh, were also forms of disavowal. They, they just, the content was different. So, you know, I know very well that there are militants among our myths, but nevertheless, they don't really matter. Or we have to, and this is an acting as if moment, we have to act as if they don't exist. So back to the first question again, there are aspects of acting as if within disavowal, but disavowal is, is, is bigger than uh, acting as if. Hmm. There are a couple of other questions about um, asking you more about the external dimensions of the of the conflict in Syria. Of course, your account in the book primarily focuses on domestic politics. Yeah. And I wonder whether we have a question, for example, from Nada Habibi asking about external intervention, uh, the role of forces such as the US and Turkey, the, the way in which Russia, Iran, Hezbollah have defended the Assad regime over the yes. last 13 years. And I wonder how and whether disavowal works in the context of how Syrians think about this external intervention. Are the same processes at work then? And um, a question from uh, a further uh, anonymous attendee. Um, does disavowal also work in how Arabs outside Syria are responding to the Syria conflict? Um, we saw varying degrees of involvement. We've seen, a, you know, the kind of launching of initiatives of normalization um, in more recent years, trying to rehabilitate the Assad regime. Do we see the, these processes of disavowal working there too, do you think? Yeah, these are great questions. And I I, I will say um, that I do think that the book is less good on um, the kind of uh, international relations aspects of, of what was going on in Syria. It's not my forte. I think it is also a problem with my home discipline of political science that we divide the world up into these sub-disciplines <laughs> ways. And, you know, I've chosen political theory and comparative politics as my sort of two homes within the within the discipline but that does have consequences for my analysis so just to put that out there and and, and recognize that um, but I will say that absolutely disavowal matters in terms of various kinds of foreign in interventions I know very well that the so among say parts of the professional managerial elite I know very well that the Russians are intervening but nevertheless it's not the same as if the Americans were intervening or the Israelis were intervening. So, you know, or um, among activists, I know very well that, um, you know, arms and things are coming through Turkey are being smuggled through Turkey. And yet, nevertheless, um, you know, we we need those arms. And, and some of this is not about convenience or rationalization, but also about a, a grappling with certain facts on the ground. So it's not to say that disavow is uh, necessarily um, a, a, a bad thing or is in any way related to false consciousness, but I do think that there are various ways in which people do try to uh, downplay in that the, the clause and yet nevertheless downplay the severity of certain kinds of practices um, that that might have had they been entertained uh, allowed us to think uh, together about you know what 
what is the nature of intervention? Why are some kinds of intervention better than others? What could have been done that wasn't done? Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, these are good questions. And for colleagues of mine who were uh, very for intervention, uh, they saw in people who were against intervention a lot of, um, you know, uh, a, a kind of betrayal of the revolution, whereas people who were uh, against uh, revolution were not necessarily signing up. In fact, most people were not signing up for the Assad regime and were uh, very committed to uh, deploring the atrocities of the Assad regime, but there were ways in which disavowal work to uh, foreclose or block access to ways of thinking that would have allowed communities to come together, um, particularly around these questions of, um, of, of intervention or uh, you know, the foreign machinations of one sort or another within Syria. And of course, many people began, or many countries rather, began to use Syria as a kind of proxy mm -hmm. playground. And, uh, and, and that's part of the tragedy. I would say, though, that had there not been this kind of ambivalent middle, that it might have been harder for um, the countries that came in on the side of the regime to make the calculation that the regime was worth saving. So that there is an important aspect strategically to the reading of this ambivalent middle in the decision among some countries like Iran and Russia to support Syria. Um, let me say one thing about normalization. Normalization in the current era is very much, it seems to me, about the exercise or an enactment of disavowal. I know very well that this regime is horrific and atrocious, and yet, nevertheless, we need to get on with our diplomacy, or we need to embrace our self-interests, or enough is enough. Or we we could end up with having having rested populations again on our own borders, and therefore we need to make these alliances. Yeah. Normalization is an excellent example. Yeah, great. Um, this is a, um, uh, I guess it's a, it's it's not quite a tangent, but it's more of a, a sidestep from the discussion of disavowal. But what about the people who are not uh, enacting disavowal, but are throwing their wholehearted support, who, who behind a regime behind. Uh, um, you know, a regime, whether it's the regime of Assad, whether it's support for Donald Trump, but who are not enacting disavowal. Um, Gabriel Young points out in our contemporary moments of global late fascism that is often a wholehearted elite and popular embrace of counter-revolution, uh, not a disavowal. And how do we, how do, we, what do we make of this? The fact that it's not simply, you know, the, the gray zone in the middle, um, but a, a much more enthusiastic endorsement of taking up of more authoritarian positions. Is this a case of acting as if? Is this a case of are these cases where we do need to take seriously the fact that people are throwing themselves passionately behind a particular cause uh, that we may not approve of uh, ourselves for political, personal, ethical reasons? So this allows me to um, uh, underscore something that may not have been clear enough in the presentation and in our conversation, which is disavowal isn't something that simply an ambivalent middle does. And the book does talk about ardent loyalists in the coastal areas of Ledi and Tortuz, for example, and 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 Ghibli and and other uh, other parts of the coastal areas. It does talk about ardent loyalists. It does talk about the ambivalent middle and that's probably where the, um, the 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 heart of the book is and it also does talk about activists so it's not about necessarily not being passionate and there are different populations and disavowal is something that uh, sort of structures all different groups within uh, Syria or any population for that matter, but it, it will just look different so that the activist who says, I know very well that there are, you know, militants among us um, is practicing disavowal, but that doesn't mean they aren't uh, ardently um, in favor of, of the revolution. Uh, similarly, some of the Shabiha, or in contrast, some of the Shabiha in the countryside who absolutely love Bashar al-Assad aren't saying that, um, you know, aren't uh, 
not practicing disavowal when they are signing up for USA, they have to do, practice a lot of disavowal in order to sign up for USA. They have to say, you know, I know very well that we are engaging in violent, brutal practices, and yet, nevertheless, we need this regime. That's a moment of dis. So, ardent loyalty. Um, uh, whether it's to the regime or to an alternative vision, it doesn't foreclose disavowal. We all practice disavowal. I am most interested in the way in which disavowal worked for the ambivalent middle because I do think it mattered tremendously during those first two years in particular of, of the uprising in foreclosing possibilities for, um, for transformation. Hmm. And I guess my I guess that brings us neatly to to my final question I want to pose to you, Lisa, which is about the possibilities for transformation. Um, and I was struck the first time I read authoritarian apprehensions by it, it seemed to be there was an there's an air of melancholy around the book. There's an air of sadness. And I, I I want to just, if I may, just read a couple of lines from the conclusion. When you talk about the wedge and you talk about creating this possibility for transformation and you say it must be accompanied by a commitment to world making in the face of disaster, acceptance of the exhaustion that accompanies failure, of the ways in which all of us are flailing in some way most of the time. In these circumstances, it means doing the hard work of mourning the loss of revolutionary promise for now and the devastating loss of human beings who are loved, cared for, and are irretrievably gone. There is an era, an, an era of sadness around the book. And I want to ask, now we are, I think, five years since the publication of the book, and with the time that has elapsed, do you still, is that era of sadness still there? Are you more optimistic about the possibility of retrieving some of that revolutionary promise that was once there? Um, how do you reassess the, the light in which you wrote this book at the time? I, I wish I could say I were uh, more optimistic. Um, I, I think um, I think the hard work of mourning is is ongoing, uh, and that doesn't mean that there aren't um, possibilities and creative acts that are going on all the time, and and also a tremendous amount of effort to rethink worlds, uh, uh, often but not exclusively in in exile, uh, for people. Um, but I do think that revolutionary transformation does require thinking about the formidable challenges to it, all of the things that can get in its way. And in some ways, the book is an effort to think with others about what those formidable challenges look like. They're not just about, you know, purchasing loyalty or co-optation or patronage in the, uh, you know, uh, reductively economic sense, but they're also about the ways in which um, feelings can be galvanized and uncertainty utilized to prevent action or mangle action. And that there are, in, in the context of war, uh, there needs to be a tremendous amount of sadness and reassessment and an acknowledgement of, of, of the depression uh, in order ultimately to move beyond it. And, you know, I do think another maybe um, limitation of the book is to focus so much of that uh, transformative power in, in the arts. And while I do think the arts are extraordinarily important to thinking about the possibility of social transformation, I don't mean to suggest that they're the exclusive way to think about social change. On that somber, yet not entirely pessimistic note, Lisa, it's been a great privilege to be able to have this conversation with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And thank you both, Dan and Lisa, for this wonderful conversation. Um, and I'm glad we ended on a semi, uh, a bittersweet note, I would say. Um, Thank you all for coming and thank you for being with us on these Crown Seminars for this academic year. While we may not have any more seminars, 
um, in 2023, 2024 academic year. We will come back in 2024 in the fall. And in the meantime, please follow us on social media and of course, follow the works of these marvelous people. And thank you all. And again, thank you, Lisa and Dan. And um, until next time.